1665 was a bad year in London. The worst outbreak of the plague since the Black Death had killed an estimated 69,000 in and around the city. But 1666 was going to be better. The plague had eased and the markets and fairs had been closed during the outbreak for reopening. And the ships were coming to port. And then on the night of September 1st, 1666, a fire started. It would burn so hot, travel so fast, and destroy so much that it would be known forever as the Great Fire of London. Let's dig into this. The summer of 1666 had been hot and dry. London was a crowded city, filled with narrow streets and mostly wooden houses. Many houses had upper levels that leaned out over the street, some almost touching each other, and many of the homes had shops on the street level. Butchers and bakers and candle makers, apothecaries and cloth makers and taverns. Of course, animals were kept too, along with stables and sheds to house them, and piles of straw, hay, and fodder to keep them. Home cooking and heating were dependent on fireplaces. Essentially, the crowded London streets were filled with mostly combustible homes and shops, filled with combustible materials. Warehouses along the Thames stored supplies and items coming into port on ships. Fires were common and feared. Folks prepared for the inevitable by forming neighborhood fire bucket brigades. They were reminded by city authorities to be careful and alert to any sign of fire. Early firefighting included hooks to pull down burning roof or wall pieces. They would be pulled down and away from other structures. Carts with hand pumps would move throughout the city, but had limited amounts of water. And since the carts and barrels were made of wood, they could burn too. These early firefighting methods could handle a small fire they couldn't handle the fire of 1666. On the night of September 1st, Thomas Farinor, or Farinor, depending on the source, the king's baker had finished work in his shop on Pudding Lane and had gone to bed. His oven was still hot. Sometime that night, sparks from the oven jumped to the firewood pile next to it. Farinor claimed later that the fire was put out and he went back to bed. It wasn't out, and it didn't take long for the fire to spread. By 1 a.m. on Sunday, September 2nd, the whole house was burning. Farriner and his family escaped, but his assistant died in the flames. The first casualty of the Great Fire. Across Pudding Lane from the Bakers was the Star Inn. The fire jumped the street and started the inn's stables on fire. The Bucket Brigade was trying to control the flames, but it was a windy night and everything was dry from the hot summer with little rain. The fire spread quickly down Fish Hill to Thames Street and to the warehouses, and oil, tallow, alcohol, turpentine, coal, well, things started to explode. Many people who had rushed to fight the fire lived in the area, and the fire was destroying their property. Many realized they had better grab what they could and evacuate as quickly as possible. The city authorities acted quickly. Brigades rushed to the area and tried to form fire breaks by pulling down roofs and even whole buildings. But the wind fanned the flames and the fire moved faster than they could work. People took what they could carry and tried to leave. Some buried their valuables before they left their homes. Streets were full of folks trying to flee. People who could not get out of the city started jumping into the Thames River. The fire could be seen for 30 to 40 miles. Samuel Pepys was a clerk in the Royal Navy, and he kept a diary of the fire. He recommended to King Charles II, who had been out helping fight the fire, that buildings be blown up to create a better fire break. The Royal Navy used gunpowder and created a break that brought the fire mostly under control on Wednesday, September 5th. 
The burned area of London was still too hot to walk through days later. Some reports state four-fifths of the city burned. Others say homes of the 70,000 of estimated 80,000 residents were destroyed. Officially, around 13,200 houses were lost. 87 parish churches were burned. The Royal Exchange, King's Wardrobe, Guild Hall, and St. Paul's Cathedral were all destroyed. An estimated 100,000 men, women, and children were left homeless. The financial loss from the fire was estimated around 10 million pounds. Incredibly, the death toll is officially listed as six people. Articles about the fire delight in saying more people have died falling or jumping off the monument to the fire than in the fire. Six people have jumped to their deaths and two have fallen off the monument. But the official records don't tell the whole story. Hundreds or even thousands could have died in a fire that huge, fast, and hot, and their bodies never would have been found. It's impossible to know. King Charles II began the rebuilding of the city within days. Plans were submitted by many of the best architects and church builders of the day. Eventually, the rebuilding commission was formed to handle the enormous tax. Sir Christopher Wren and Robert Hooke did most of the work, with Wren also designing a new St. Paul's Cathedral and Hooke designing others. It took 30 years to rebuild most of the city. New houses and buildings were built of brick or stone where they could be. Walls were built thicker, and the height of buildings was reduced. Roads were made wider, and alleyways were forbidden. The use and storage of combustible materials was better regulated. Every attempt was made to prevent a major fire in the city's future. Together, Wren and Hook designed and built the monument to the Great Fire of London, built at Fish Hill between 1671 and 1677. It stands 2,002 feet tall with a golden flaming urn at its top. It was intended to hold an enormous telescope, but vibrations from the roads made using a scope of this size for astronomical measurement impossible. The only person ever held responsible for the Great Fire of London was a French watchmaker named Robert Hubert. He confessed to starting the fire and was hanged on October 27, 1666. No one knows why he confessed. Records were found many years later that proved he was not even in London on September 2, 1666. In fact, he was at sea when the fire started. In 1986, 320 years after the fire, the Worshipful Company and Bakers formally apologized to the Mayor of London and placed a plaque acknowledging King's Baker Thomas Farriner as the man who started the Great Fire of London. The plaque is on Pudding Lane. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed this video. And don't forget to check out some of our other videos. Have a good one. We'll see you on the next one.